Mark chapter 6, verse 39. They commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. They sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among they all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. All four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, record this miracle. Tonight, I'd like to speak to you on managing the miracle. God bless you. Please be seated. It's great to have our kids with us tonight. I mentioned this uh, recently, just kind of extemporaneously, and maybe an altar service, and it's stuck in my spirit. And so I began to think about this and study and pray about uh, managing the miracle. A miracle occurs when God suspends the laws of nature. Miracles are not limited to healings like blindness, cancer, impairment, deafness, leprosy, or limbs that are straightened or even grow back. Uh, Miracles are not limited to deliverance like sin, addictions, demonic possession, mental illness, the effects of abuse. The Bible said that he brings deliverance to the captives. Miracles can be miracles of provision like manna, quail, water, meal in the barrel, or 5,000 men plus women and children being fed. They're also natural miracles like a sundial going backwards or the Red Sea parting, the walls of Jericho falling, Peter walking on water or a storm calm. A miracle occurs when God suspends the laws of nature. There are also miracles of resurrection and the great miracle that we love to celebrate is the miracle of salvation. Miracles demonstrate God's control over the natural world that he created. Nature itself is a testimony of God's miraculous power. Psalm 19 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God, the heavens preach, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Romans 1 tells us that the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The Bible also tells us that God not only created all things, but he holds them up by the word of his power, which is a pretty amazing thought. The recent solar eclipse is a testimony to the genius of our all-powerful God. Amen? What a great God we serve. In the ministry of Jesus, there are 34 specific miracles recorded that he performed. But John wrote that he did many more, John 20 and 30, and many other signs. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But if they should be written, uh, he said, but these are written that you might believe. In other words, the miracles that were recorded had a specific angle or a point to prove that Jesus Christ was the son of God according to the flesh, God in the flesh, and that believing you might have life through his name. John also wrote that Jesus did many other things that if they were all written down, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Now, this miracle of the feeding of 5,000 recorded in all the gospels uh, is an amazing miracle. 5,000 men plus women and children, five loaves and two fishes. There is a second miracle of a feeding of a multitude. Jesus fed 4,000 men plus women and children with seven loaves and a few fish. Matthew 15 and Mark 7 record that miracle. I've thought and taught about that before, that in the feeding of the 5,000, He started with less, fed more, and had more left over. In the feeding of the 4,000, he started with more, fed fewer, and had less left over because God's math is not like our math. Amen. This story, 
I, I want to read it from the book of Mark, our text, Mark chapter 6. We're going to back up a little bit. I'll walk through this story and want to make some observations about managing the miracle from this and a few other stories. He said to them, come yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Uh, the disciples in Jesus were at a very busy season of ministry. We think that busyness is unique to 2024 or our modern culture. Many were coming and going and they did not have any leisure so much as to eat. I've had a few seasons in my life like that. So they went on a ministerial retreat to get away from the good people that God called them to serve. They went to a desert place by ship privately, but the people saw where they were headed. Uh, they knew where they were going. The Bible says they outran them. They went around the shoreline and when Jesus and the disciples breathed a sigh of relief, they were going to get a break. Everybody was waiting for them. Welcome. We're so glad. Let's have another church service today. The disciples were not that excited, but the Bible says in verse 34, uh, this was a, this miracle, by the way, begins by, with a failed ministry retreat. I just wanted to officially make that point. Jesus saw the people. He's moved with compassion toward them because they're like sheep not having a shepherd. And he started to teach them many things. Now the day is far spent. The disciples came to him, said, this is a desert place, not just like Mojave Desert, but it's an isolated place. We're out in the country. It's not a desert if he's going to have them sit down on the green grass, right? So it's just a place where there's no restaurants. McDonald's is too far away, and we need to let these people go. The time is far past. Send them away that they can go in the country, round about in the villages, and buy bread. They have nothing to eat. But Jesus answered them, give them to eat. And they said, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? That might have been all that was in Judas's bag. <clears throat> but um, this is a little thing I've learned about ministry, that Jesus tells you to feed people with stuff you don't have. You never feel adequate for ministry because our sufficiency is of God and not of ourselves. And if God called you to do something that you do yourself in the energy of the flesh or with your intellect, talent, or ability, then it wouldn't be spiritual. So you always feel like you're in over your head when you're doing ministry. So when you feel that way, just thank God because he'll come through for you if you'll do your best and trust him and not walk presumptuously in the energy of the flesh. So lesson from verse 37, verse 38. He said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they said five loaves and two fishes. Now I have a wonderful tool called a harmony of the gospels. It's an amazing book. And I have a companion book, the words and works of Jesus Christ by J Dwight Pentecost, but it puts all four gospels side by side in parallel. So whatever Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or one or two or three or all four of the gospels may record an event, it shows them side by side. So I did that, you know, as I like to do, uh, and I can do that on my computer, but I like to see it in the book. And um, it's wonderful to see the harmony and to see what each gospel said. In John chapter six, verse nine, John is the one who notes there's a lad here. There's a little boy here and he's got his lunch with him. 5,000 men, women and children. I'm sorry to say that it looks like only one mom packed her boy's lunch. I don't know. There's a lad here. He's got a lunch and uh, all we've got is five loaves. And that's not like a giant loaf you bought at the grocery store. It's probably like five little individual, like a, a roll that you would eat. Think about a little boy. He's got a couple little sardines that he's going to eat for lunch that day and five little barley loaves, one of the gospels say. And that's all they have. And it's in a little boy's hands. 
It, of course, also seems inadequate for what needs to be done to meet the need of 5,000 men plus women and children. Verse 39, and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies on the green grass. And the reason I chose to teach this primarily from Mark is because I like the way Mark shows how the miracle was managed. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven, he blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them, all the people that were sitting in companies of 150 and the two fishes divided he among them all, verse 42, and they did all eat and were filled. And we know that they will take up 12 baskets full when the miracle is over. Now, now this is an incredible miracle of provision. And I know that this has been depicted in movies and scenes. And well, how did this happen? Uh, it's in his hand that the bread multiplies and the fish multiply. And it looks like he divides and multiplies the bread and then the fish. But I really don't know. And I really don't think I need to figure it out. Uh, we were kind of reflecting recently and I said, wouldn't it be awesome when we got to heaven if we could watch movies of time? Say, I want to watch Jericho fall. And you just push play and you get to go watch, watch how it happened. Wouldn't that be incredible? So, I mean, you've got all eternity. So it wouldn't take that long, basically, to watch 6,000, 7,000 years of human history so why not, you know, and just go to the library or maybe you can just see it. You'll know even as also you are known, whatever that means. But anyway, you can just think about that. But how, how cool would it, would it be to watch this miracle take place? Now, I want to make it clear that Jesus is the main character of this story. Not the little boy, not the disciples. And the miracle is the means of satisfying the hunger of people. Nothing we can ever do will satisfy an empty soul. <clears throat> Amen? Now, I know we're not supposed to say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. We should give food and clothing when it is appropriate to meet practical needs in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you give a cup of cold water in his name, you'll not lose your reward and and the people that came to in prison and sick and all of those examples in Matthew 25. But it's the miracle that satisfies their hunger. And I don't want to take anything away from that. In all my years of ministry, I've, I've never really taught on this. It just occurred to me the other day uh, that just look at the organization. Those of you who know me well know I love it. 5,000 men plus women and children. Um, Jesus could have made the fish leap out of his hands into their mouths. You know, the Bible says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. <laughs> 5,000 men, women and children say, ah, here comes lunch, <clears throat> dinner. But he chose to let his disciples assist in managing the miracle. I believe there's no accidental words in the Bible. The very words are God-breathed, every jot, tittle. Everything that's included, everything that is not included is authoritative. It's anointed by God. And, and Jesus chose to organize this miracle. So years and years ago, some of you have reminded me about this. I was teaching this story and I had a little fun and I just kept letting there be more people. 5,000, 7, 10, 15, 20, 25. I honestly believe that there could have been 25,000 people. If you just have men, wives, two kids, you've got it, right? But, you know, and they had a lot of children back then. 
But I'm going to go tonight with a lower number of 15,000, 5,000 men plus women and children. So we're going we're gonna to do math with 15,000 people for this miracle. So that's just one lady per man and one kid per couple. And so that means, that means, now, when Jesus said, I want you to sit down in groups, he first said of, well, of 100. Now, maybe it wasn't an equal, exactly equal number, but, you know, that would trouble me. But there were groups of 100. So we want 100, 100, 100, 100. And then we want groups of 50. So we're going to subdivide each group of 100. So we're going to have groups of 50. So 150 groups of 100, going with 15,000. And then we're going to subdivide. So now we have 300 groups of 50 people, if that's 15,000 people. That means that each of the 12 disciples were responsible to serve bread and fish to 25 groups of 50 people each. And uh, unless there was more organization than we know about from what's written in the Bible. So, <clears throat> Jesus is doing what he does. He's multiplying bread and fishes. And Jesus organizes this miracle. Sometimes he lets us do the organization. But he organizes it. Sit down in companies of 100 and then 50. And uh, it's awesome what he does. But who is going to manage the miracle? It's the disciples. It's the twelve. Verse 43, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes, and they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now, management can never create a miracle, but, but here is my overarching point tonight, that we are laborers together with God, amen? amen? The Bible says that one person plants Another person waters, but God gives the increase. But human hands have to go plant the seed of the word of God. And human hearts and hands and prayers have to water the seed that has been planted. But ultimately, if God does not work with us, nothing will happen. But God chooses to be a partner with us in ministry, which is pretty amazing. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, labors together with God. Now, <clears throat> there are many, many examples in the Bible. My Bible reading earlier in the year, when we're talking about the tabernacle plan and who was over what and who they answered to, they showed supervisors and workers and job descriptions, an amazing organization in the Old Testament. You may think those people didn't have organization Read David's kingdom, Solomon's kingdom. You'll read about amazing structure and organization that they had back in that day. But I was thinking about Solomon's temple, the dedication of Solomon's temple. The presence of God was so powerful and thick. The Bible said, 2 Chronicles 7, 1, the fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the house, so much so that the priest could not even enter into the house of the Lord because of the glory uh, filled the Lord's house. It was an amazing supernatural miracle. But because of this train of thought, I thought, who helped manage that miracle? So let me just give you three high-level areas. First of all, the temple had to be built with materials. And David said that the work ahead of Solomon is tremendous, but he said, using every resource at my command, there's enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, quantities of onyx, precious stones, costly jewels uh, of all kinds, fine stone and marble. This is First Chronicles 29. David said, I've given all of my own private treasures of gold, silver, to help with this construction. In addition to the building materials, I've already collected for his holy temple. Everybody say managing the miracle. David said, I've donated more than 112 tons of gold, 
262 tons of refined silver to be used in overlaying the walls. Gold, silver, and for the craftsmen. And then the family leaders gave more for the temple of God, 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, 3,050 tons of iron. This is First Chronicles 29.7 in the New Living Translation that translate weights and measures into what is more readable for us Americans. And then there were numerous precious stones that were donated and they were given freely and wholeheartedly by King David and all the people. So in this miracle of the glory of God coming down, first of all, somebody had to gather a lot of materials. And then secondly, somebody had to build it. First Kings 5 and 13, a labor force of 30,000 men from Israel. He sent them to Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 every month. You were on 30 days and off 30 days, or a Jewish month, on and off a month. And he had somebody at an Iram who was in charge of those shifts of 10,000 men each. And then Solomon also had 70,000 common laborers, 80,000 quarry workers in the hill country and 3,600 foremen to oversee the work. It was a very organized effort to manage the miracle. Lots and lots of structure. And then the third thing that I want to point out is that when the temple was dedicated to the Lord, the Bible said that Solomon and all the probably more people than just the priests were involved, that they sacrificed 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. Second Chronicles 7, 4, 5, 6 in that neighborhood. That is a lot of animals. 144,000 sacrificial animals. Right? 142,000. So, Somebody had to kill them, get the blood. There was a 14-day feast. They might have eaten a lot of those animals. But somebody had to have a corral, had to birth all those animals, had to feed them, had to water them, had to shelter them, had to keep them. They had to bring them. They had to be sacrificed. And if you think about the moment, that the glory of God descended in the temple. And if you were one of those guys who raised sheep or oxen, if you were one of the 70,000 laborers or the 80,000 quarry workers or the 30,000 laborers, or if you were one of the people who gave for materials for the temple and you knew that you helped manage that miracle, when the glory of God fell in that temple that day, that you were part of that miracle, that's pretty awesome to think about. And when the glory of God lifted in the 14-day feast was over, the Bible doesn't really say this, but who cleaned it up? I've learned it gets lonely at the end of an event. Thank you to everybody who stays until the end for the cleanup. Somebody help manage that miracle. One more example. In Acts 2, we know that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, right? They were all with one accord, one place. Sound from heaven, rushing mighty wind. They're all filled 120, and it is followed by a sermon by Simon Peter, and it is followed by Acts 2.41. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. That same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Church Sunday, April 14. 2024, the altar call is given. Suddenly there's a long line of people 
out the door down Skyview Drive and around Mount Vernon. Did you say 3,000 want to get baptized today? Changing rooms, clean, warm water. You know, we say this all the time. We've got, wait, garments, uh, <laughs> towels, uh, 3,000, 1,000, 100, 50. Sorry, but you need another plan. Your plan is not big enough for God's plan. In the new sanctuary, we'll have more changing rooms, but I'm just going to tell you, there's not 3,000. And I don't believe that it had to be just the apostles that baptized that day, but, you know, maybe the 12 did, maybe the 120 did, maybe they got more. But let's just say that 3,000 people had to be baptized by the 12 that would be 250 people per apostle. If it took two minutes per person, you could do it in 8.3 hours at a rate of about 31 an hour. It's doable. Just in case you're wondering. Somebody had to manage the miracle. And I believe more people were baptized or baptizing. But then, you know, some people, oh, there's no, there was not enough water in Jerusalem to baptize that many people. Why are we worried about that? Why do we even want to question whether there was enough people to baptize 3,000 or enough water to baptize 3,000 people in Jerusalem that day? But if you look, there's an answer, and I'm not sure I have a definitive answer, but it was very doable. There was the pool of Siloam, the pool of Bethesda, and then there were ritual pools called mikvah. And those were like little private ceremonial baptistries where Jewish people would wash ritually before they would go to worship. So I wanted to search that out a little bit more. There were numerous around the temple mount. Uh, it was a stepped immersion pool used by Jews for purification. There were hundreds of them excavated of Jewish communities before, during, and after the time of Jesus. They've been found as far away as France. They were found in the intertestamental period, located near synagogues. Archaeologists have discovered more than 125 mikvahs near the Temple Mount, many of them along a main road that led to the southern interest. And there's a lot more you can read about that. I don't know where they baptized them. And there's other sources that say other places, right? But here's what I know. That God could fill 3,000 people with the Holy Ghost in one moment. No big deal for God. However many empty vessels are available, that's how many he can fill in a moment of time. And when we had the, the giant Ethiopian crusades, when there would be a million people spread out, hearing the gospel preached by relay and 100,000 received the Holy Ghost. That's no challenge to my faith. Sometimes we have a harder time believing there were 20 than 100,000. But I know how great God is and I know that he can do it. So I'm not really worried about what God is going to do. I'm more concerned about managing the miracle so we make enough room for God to work among us. I want to be part of managing that miracle. If my job, if my job is to pass out loaves and fishes, that doesn't seem very miraculous, but I get to be a part of that. Amen. I believe that God is going to pour down showers of blessing. Have you ever wondered how you have a thought? You know, I think I'm going to have a thought right now, a thought today. I think I'm going to have a thought. I think I'm going to think about something. I found that when you read and study and pray that you have a thought. But in all the years of my ministry, I've never taught on managing the miracle. 
and why recently has the Lord put in my heart to talk about this. And Bible readers, Bible students, mature saints of God, when I started on any one of these stories, you already know where I'm going because you know your Bible. Oh, yeah. But God allows you to see a facet of truth, maybe in a way you haven't seen before because he's preparing you for something. Miracles, deliverance, salvation, reconciliation, restoration, provision. We need every hand and every heart fully engaged in the harvest to help manage the miracles that God is going to send. Amen. I thank God for every spirit-filled person in our church, everybody in the body of Christ. I especially appreciate the 342 plus volunteers who serve in 895 plus ministry positions. I'm saying plus because those are January 2024 numbers. But from, here's the list. Lawn care, cleaning, janitorial, maintenance, parking, open up, lock up, guest experience, usher, safety team, security team, attendance, production, technology, photography, worship team, musicians, and vocalists, altar, baptismal, discipleship team, death ministry, guest follow-up, hospitality, nursery, chips, crowd, crossover, hyphen, life groups, special event volunteers, Bible quizzing, care, small groups, Bible study, hope, nursing home, life recovery in prison, prayer teams, ladies prayer, pastors, prayer partners, church staff, pastors, missions, counseling, wedding, funeral, trustee board, board of directors, and maybe somebody I missed, but I did try to get them all. Everybody who serves everywhere organizationally helps manage that miracle. I, I learned this when I worked at World Evangelism Center, World Headquarters, they call it now, that the farther you are away from the miracle, the more vision you need to faithfully serve and in turn manage that miracle. When you're cutting the grass and spraying weeds or, you know, working out there in the hot sun or, or fixing a lock or vacuuming a floor, it's not nearly as exciting as watching somebody speak in tongues for the very first time. But everybody who does anything anywhere in the life of the church helps manage the miracle. You make it happen by what you do. And we need everybody fully engaged in making it happen. Your role is vital to the whole of what God is doing. And we want to be ready to manage the miracles that God is giving us. So what can we do? We can be like the people in Acts chapter 6 who were going to serve on what I feel was like a benevolence committee. Their qualifications were honest, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. So I think wherever you serve, you should be full of the Holy Ghost. Wisdom's good, honest is good, but full of the Holy Ghost. And you may need more Holy Ghost to run sound than you do to sing. But everybody, everywhere, needs to at least be filled with the Holy Ghost. Full, full of the Holy Ghost got to be willing to serve, able to serve. That means trained, prepared, equipped, serve when you're scheduled, serve with all your heart, do it as unto the Lord, unto God, not as unto men. Serve with excellence. What I've shown about our organizational management of the miracle, but let me just go to the personal side. We like to talk about the organizational and the organic side of ministry, the the structure, but then also the individual side of that. The most meaningful way that you can manage the miracle is by bringing people to the Lord. How about that? Remember the feeding of the 5,000? Somebody said, hey, found this kid. He might can use him. He's got lunch. I mean, think about how Absurd that was. That's all we got. Just give it to Jesus. Let him figure it out. 
They did. And he did. The Gospels teach the power of personal evangelism. John the Baptist introduces his disciples to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. And they followed Jesus. And they asked where he lived. And Jesus said, come and see. This is in John 1. And then one of those who followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And the very first thing that Andrew did was find his brother, Simon, and bring him to Jesus. And Jesus said, you're Simon. You'll be called Cephas. You're kind of impetuous, but you're going to be like a rock one day, solid. And he brought him to Jesus. And then Jesus found Philip. And the very first thing Philip did was find Nathaniel and brought him to Jesus. It was personal evangelism. And they just said, come and see. Brother Jury's taught about come and see. Now, statistically, personal invitations that come from friends or family members are the most effective way to reach people with the gospel. When Arne was a church growth expert, he may still be alive, in his research, he said the number one reason people come to church is called the friendship factor. Here's it goes, a book, your oikos, your household, your sphere of influence, the people that you know and you come in contact in the course of your week. When Arne said, we've asked more than 50,000 people over a 10-year period why they came to church. And our results show that between 75 and 90% of respondents say they started attending church because somebody invited them. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has 83% as the percentage of people who came to church because of a personal invitation. My dad, George Johns, went to a Pentecostal church because Thelma Cotts invited him. That's the only reason dad went. And when dad went, he felt the power of God and said, these people have something I don't have. And I want it. You've heard me talk about that before. There's another stat. You know, numbers of st statistics. How many people walk in the door? Six to eight percent. How many come because of a program? Two to three percent. How many like the pastor? This is depressing. Eight to ten percent. That doesn't mean you, the rest don't like him, but that's why they came. Somebody had a need that was to be met by the church. Three to four percent. They got evangelized by mass evangelism, one to two percent. Attracted by Sunday school, three to four percent. How many came because they were invited by a friend or relative? Again, it can range from 75 to 90 percent. Can go with, you know, Billy Graham evangel. But most everybody who comes comes because of you. Because God uses us to manage the miracle. He can do what we can't do, but He's a labor together with us, and he's commissioned us, you know, to be his hands, his feet, his voice, his witness in the world. In the book, The Unchurched Next Door, Tom Rayner, they did three years of extensive research on unchurched people and unchurched people who had been to church less than three times in a year. When they surveyed unchurched people, 82% of unchurched people said they were likely to attend church if somebody just invited them. If somebody invited me, I'd go 82%. They're varying stats all the way up to 92%. <clears throat> That's a staggering statistic. Think about our city, the thousands of people that are one take two card away from coming to Atlanta West, one personal invitation away, thousands of thousands of people. And then they say, but why don't guests come? And the statistic is that only about 2% of church people ever invite anybody to come to church. 
Now, the Bible says that Romans 1 and 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the chief first and also to the Greek. Romans 10 said, you can't call on someone you haven't believed and you know, how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. The most effective and powerful way for us to manage the miracle is just to get people under the sound of a preacher to hear the word of God. That could be in a personal Bible study. It could be across the table, in a car, at work. It doesn't have to be from a pulpit, but it can be. Brother Jerry Miller, uh, who's helping us manage our guests and altar, he did some analysis at Atlanta West. This is not Wynn Arn or Tom Rayner. This is Atlanta West from June 2023 through March 2024. And they've been asking people why you come to Atlanta West. Someone invited us, 42%. Not provided, 36%. So we have a big block of people who didn't tell us why they came. Visiting from out of town, 8%. Internet, 7%. Drive-by, 4%. Social media, 4%. Here's a chart. I think we have this chart that you can see that kind of displays why people come. Now, if you take 36 and 42, that's a lot. That would be more like the other statistics that you see from church growth analysts who study why people come to church. But we're not going to try to guess. We're going to try to do a better job at capturing the 36% that didn't tell us. But if you look at all the other stats, the vast majority of people who told us why they came. Four out of 10, right? Somebody invited me to come. Now, if you look at these statistics, in 2023, we had an average attendance of seven. Oh, six. You can take that chart down, but thank you. And that's a net attendance with duplicates subtracted. 706. Our team uh, defined 2,073 unique individuals who checked in at some event at AWPC, church, small group, some way we captured their name. We know 2,073 people. Not to be confused with average attendance, 706. We had, and this number is really still very low from pre-COVID numbers, but we identified 436 first-time guests in 2023. Now, we know people come and go, and we don't capture them. We don't know, well, not capture them, but, you know, like capture them. We don't know. But that's like 0.61 guests per member per year. That means that all of us together are responsible for less than one first-time guest per year coming to church. Given that we had 52 Sundays and 706 average attendance, that means we together collectively, not our 1,034 members, but just going with the average attendance, we had 36,000 712 opportunities to bring somebody to church. Each of us, average attendance, times 52 Sundays, that's, that's 36,712 cards to give out, and we'll buy more cards, 36,000. That's cheap. We give them all out, we'll buy more. There are 36,000 opportunities. Now, the Billy Graham Association, they have a statistic that the average church member knows between five and eight people that they could invite. So seven, seven unchurched people. And they say that on average, like 82% of those people will come if you just ask them. I know there's a lot of statistics here. So that means if you ask seven, 5.7 of them will come. Let's just say five, right? If 706 people would just ask seven people over the course of the next year to come to church and we would continue to ask them 4,052 first-time guests instead of 432, like 10 times more first-time people to 
experience a miracle in their lives if everybody just invited more people to church, even if you got turned down a lot. 77 first-time guests per Sunday. Oh, no, that's bad. They take our seats, and they would get our parking spots. We need 31 more parking spaces for them if it's 2.5 people per car. How exciting. If we have that many new people every Sunday to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many more healings? How many more deliverances? How many more incredible things? How many families put back together? How many marriages saved just because we did what we could to manage the miracle? If you don't mind, please stand. Well, I know uh, a lot of those people go to church and, okay, let's take away two. Some of them live too far away. Why don't you just try? If we got them here once and they didn't want to come back because it was too far, we'll figure out a way for them to watch online, find a church near them. We're connected to Atlanta West. Maybe they're not, but rather than just say, oh, there's this obstacle and that obstacle, why not just try? Because I feel so strongly that God has given us incredible opportunities to manage the miracle that he desires to do. Have them sit down in groups of 150. Baptize 3,000 on a single day. Figure out a way to let God be God and let the church create a bigger basket, a bigger mindset, stretch our thinking. Because statistically, statistically, more people will come than we think. If you're in sales, you know, and I don't like to say it like this, it's a numbers game, right? You just keep asking more people. You keep offering more people. Somebody doesn't want to accept the gospel, Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet, go to another town. I don't like to see people as numbers, but Jesus said, go to someone else. They don't want to be saved. Don't give up. Go to someone else because you never know. But our job is to work with God to do everything we can individually, organizationally, to help manage the miracle so that in that moment that they're in the presence of God, we watch their life transformed by a God that will do and can do what we could never do. But we are laborers together with God in managing the miracle. If you're able, have a few minutes. Would you gather at the altar? I want us to just ask the Lord to help us think bigger and think better and ask God to let this house of miracles, we believe that miracles happen in our lives and in this church. That when people come into the presence of God, That there is nothing too hard for God. Nothing he cannot do. God will do what only God can do if we will do what he has commissioned us to do to manage the miracle. Amen.